Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Sorry, I didn't press the right button there for a second, so I don't know if you guys heard me, but you know, that's what happens when we do this kind of stuff. So right now we have Christopher Go, and he is gonna be talking about planetary imaging. So this is like the complete opposite of what Adam was doing. And if you can kind of see in your corner, somewhere down there and over here and everything else, um, we're gonna get started. So Chris, can you hear us? Yeah, can, can you guys hear Chris? Uh-oh, we lost him. Are you there, Chris? Say something. Uh-oh, minor hiccups going on here. We'll, we'll get his audio back up in just two seconds. Uh, have you been, Chris, have you muted? Uh, we can't hear him at this, at this exact moment. Give us two seconds and we're just going to just quickly figure out what's going on. Can you on hear me? With... Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. All right. Talk, Chris. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Good. Everybody, can everybody hear Chris right now? Give it a couple of seconds for, for it to catch up on the live stream. Um, there is a, quite a delay, so. All right, Chris, you're good to go. They can hear you now. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. So I'm going to have a three-part talk. Um, the first part will be an introduction to uh, modern planetary imaging. The second part, we're hoping tomorrow, if the sky is clear, we're going to have a live imaging session. Um, I'm going to go out there, image. Uh, we're going to image Jupiter. And uh, if we have time, try to image Mars um, in, in the time frame. Um, so we're hoping uh, right now it's totally overcast here in Cebu. But uh, we're hoping to have clear skies tomorrow. If not, uh, we might have to move it on Sunday. But uh, we'll, we'll just see. And the third part of my talk will be, we're gonna do a live processing. So um, you know, hopefully everything will uh, cooperate, including the weather. So we're gonna do an introduction to uh, planetary imaging. Uh, well, basically when we're doing planetary imaging, we're basically fighting the atmosphere. Um, well, uh, this is our, our only problem. We have this atmosphere which degrades image. Unfortunately, uh, we cannot live without the atmosphere. So we try to find ways to overcome this uh, problem. So the first uh, way is uh, getting out of the atmosphere. So we spend spacecrafts. Um, the second one is uh, adaptive optics, which uh, was developed uh, you know, a few decades ago, uh, firstly by the National Security Agency of the United States to spy on Earth. And it was declassified and you know, the technology was given to ast astronomers and is currently used uh, by big observatories Unfortunately, the first two technology is uh, rather way out of our budget. Uh, a lot of these cost, uh, you know, getting out of the atmosphere would cost billions of dollars. While uh, adaptive optics right now, um, there's a guy in San Diego, Don Burns, uh, who's actually developing um, amateur uh, scale adaptive optics. Unfortunately, you know, the price is still, I think he's uh, quoting around 50, 50K for the adaptive optics. Well, the, myth, the method which uh, is uh, uh, affordable for us is uh, lucky imaging. So what is lucky imaging? So basically what we're doing is we're capturing videos of the planet using um, high speed, highly sensitive videos and using software to basically sort out the good and the bad and stack them. So the development of uh, lucky imaging came about with, uh, first of all, inexpensive uh, video capture device. Uh, we started with webcams. Uh, I remember, uh, I think, uh, what is it? Uh, more than 15 years ago, uh, we were starting to use the 2U cam. 
which was the first uh, planetary cam that was used. I think uh, some uh, imagers were also using the quick cam. Then came the security cameras from different manufacturers like uh, the imaging source or uh, uh, you know, a lot of these companies were making uh, security cameras which we adapted to astro use. And finally, right now we have some uh, companies, uh, uh, astro camera companies that are making dedicated planetary cameras. Now, there's a, another uh, important advancement, which is the computer interface, computer hardware. We now have very powerful computers. I remember before when I started, um, when, when I had my first computer, the only thing, we, the fastest interface we had was uh, the parallel port. We had a serial and a parallel port. And uh, you know, the, the, these uh, interfaces uh, are, are not enough to uh, gather the data or absorb the data that the modern cameras have. Right now, uh, we're, uh, most of these cameras use USB 3, which can transfer you know, a lot of data into your, into your computer. And the most important development really is uh, the development of software control and the uh, processing software dedicated for uh, planetary imaging. And one thing amazing is that these softwares are free. Uh, controlled software like Fire Capture, and processing software like Autostackert and uh, Registax, which we use. Um, these developments really helped out in the development of uh, planetary imaging. Now, to choose the right equipment, um, um, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, consideration that we have, but you know, any equipment is capable of basically uh, imaging the planets, but well, so some equipment would be better than others. Uh, the first is the, the telescope. Uh, you know, the bigger the telescope, the, the more data you'll get, the, the bigger resolution you'll have. <clears throat> when I started imaging, actually, I used uh, an astrophysics uh, 130 EDF. Uh, it was uh, an old astrophysics oil space refractor. And uh, in one of those, I remember it was during the time of the great Mars opposition in 2003, we were having a, uh, we, in, in one of the universities here in Cebu, we had a uh, public outreach where we showed the, the, you know, the public uh, Mars. And I set up two telescopes. The first was the AP-130 and the second one was a C uh, C8. Then uh, I had a comment from one of the, one of the people who were obs was observing and they said that, you know, um, the C8 is getting better image than your uh, uh, the refractor. Uh, this this wasn't uh, you know uh, expert image uh, amateur astronomer, but you know the ordinary public. And I, I was wondering, are you sure? You know th this this AP refractor cost six times more than my uh, C8. So I went there and looked, and uh, true enough, the you know aperture rules the C8 had better quality. So I switched from imaging the C8. To the, uh, from the AP-130 to the C-8. And uh, basically for the past couple of years, I upgraded to the C-11 and uh, right now I'm using the C-14. So uh, basically, why do I choose the uh, schmidt gassy Um Well, you can actually use Newtonians. A lot of imagers like uh, Anthony Wesley, Phil Miles, they use Newtonians. But the thing is the, 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 C, uh, the schmidt gassy grain these, these are compact telescopes and uh, Mostly the quality of the C4, uh, the schmidt cassie grains, uh, you only need a small area in your chip to uh, basically um, to image. So, you know, the, as long as the center part is good, then, you know, usually you'll have a good quality image. I've been lucky because my three schmidt cassie grains have been good. I've been getting good images with, with the three of them uh, from the C8, 11, and the 14. And uh, it's easier to mount because of the compact design. And you do need, uh, because of the uh, magnification that you're using, you need a good mount, uh, a solid mount to, to, to do planetary imaging. Now, the cameras, um, when we started imaging, we had a web, webcam, but uh, right now, uh, very few people use the webcam. Uh, there's a lot of inexpensive high-speed cameras available, uh, especially from QHY and other companies. 
Um, the, uh, these are affordable uh, right now and uh, with very powerful interface. One thing you should be wary about webcam is that because it's used to uh, run image to the internet, a lot of these webcams actually compress data. And this is a problem because uh, when you compress data, you lose a lot of data uh, because, uh, well, it's just the nature of webcams that they have to course through the data through the internet. So to save on bandwidth, they try to reduce the amount of data. While uh, the high-speed cameras, you know, you get the full force of the data. You can get actually the basically everything. So you get you you probably get better quality image with a high-speed camera. Now, a, a lot of, uh, a big question is: uh, Should you use color or monochrome? Uh, there's a big problem when you're imaging planets, uh, especially when the planets are low. Anything below 70 degrees altitude, what happens is uh, you get at atmospheric dispersion, which means that the three colors uh, will not focus on the same plane. Uh, in a sense, uh, th that's the reason why a lot of people use monochrome cameras right now. Uh, they use filters, uh, RGB filters to recreate the color. But uh, by using uh, separate RGB filters, you basically are able to uh, basically, uh, uh, well, uh, this, uh, go, um, uh, compensate for atmospheric dispersion. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, there's a device, uh, it's called the ADC, which uh, ZWO sells, uh, the atmospheric dispersion corrector, uh, which basically helps in, helps color cameras to, uh, 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 basically overcome atmospheric dispersion. Uh, personally, I haven't used uh, the ADC, but I've heard a lot of people are being able to successfully use this with a color cam. Uh, well, the color cam is much easier and I would recommend it to the beginner, for the beginner. But unfortunately right now, the, the two major planets, uh, especially Saturn and Jupiter are on the Southern hemisphere and Mars right now is still on the Southern Hemisphere until basically later this year will it, where it will slowly move to the Northern Hemisphere. But for the next probably three, uh, next uh, four years, the, the Saturn and Jupiter will stay in the Southern Hemisphere. So you will need, need something to compensate the atmospheric dispersion. The ADC will help. And also, uh, if you really want the best image, it's really, you know, going monochrome is really the best. But the thing is, uh, monochrome is far more expensive because and not only is the monochrome camera more expensive, which is funny because uh, you would think that, uh, you know, color TV and a black and white TV, black and a color should be more expensive. But in the case of uh, these cameras, the monochrome is actually more expensive than the color cameras. Plus you have to buy a filter wheel and uh, to and the filters to uh, basically create the color images. But, you know, it's a complicated setup, complicated processing, but you get the best image with a, with a monochrome camera. Now, um, what, one thing you should uh, bear in mind also with, uh, with these cameras is that um, uh, you should check on the interface, make sure it's USB 3. A lot of uh, older cameras use USB 2. Probably if you're using ROI, that might not be a problem, but when you're imaging the moon or the sun, uh, the interface would really help a lot. Uh, having a fast interface would be very important. But most of the new cameras are USB 3, so this should not be a problem if you buy a more recent camera. Now, another problem with the, the color cam is if you look at this image, you'll see grids. Um, you know, uh, technically the monochrome camera is more sensitive than the, the color cam. And this is because uh, it doesn't have those Bayer filters. The Bayer filters are what creates the color. So each pixel of the monochrome camera has uh, about four filters. The, basically it has its own RGB filter that basically recreates the color. And uh, uh, if you look at this image closely, you'll see some grid lines in the image. So this is the Bayer lines. This is the, basically the space between the filters. And uh, th this is a big problem with the color cam. And uh, one thing you should also bear in mind because uh, one, one, one thing about color cams is that when you're going into RAW mode, RAW, R-A-W mode, um, the image will look black and white. <laughs> It'll look monochrome, but it's actually color. And you have to re-extract the color 
when you're uh, basically stacking in uh, AutoStacker or using another software to convert the raw into uh, a color image. Uh, why, uh, if you're using a, uh, a more color cam, I would always recommend raw because it gives you the, the best data for capturing uh, using a color cam. But in the end, you know, this is an image using a color cam. Uh, this, this is actually image using a next Celestron Next Image 5. So this is a, a very old camera, USB 2, which I used, uh, I tested a couple of years ago. And uh, even with a color cam, with, this is with, a, with my C14, you can get a respectable image. It's, it's actually a, a, a good image. So, um, but uh, the thing is, when I took this image, Jupiter was 80 degrees above the horizon. So it, it was basically over, close to overhead. So um, I would, uh, in the end, uh, really, if you want to get the best image, get an ADC or get a, a monochrome cam with the filters. Now, these are other things that you will need. Um, uh, I, for those of you who were imaging before with the uh, film, I remember you, we were using eyepiece projection when we we're imaging planets. Uh, in the case of the C uh, CMOS or uh, a digital imaging, you only need a Barlow because of the small pixel size of the, of the cameras. Uh, right now I use the astrophysics uh, Barcon. Uh, which is a variable Barlow. Uh, I like it because I can basically play with the magnification depending on the distance between the lens, uh, the Barlow lens and the camera chip. Uh, it's, it's quite flexible for me to use uh, this, this Barlow. Uh, you don't need eyepiece projection anymore when, when, using, um, when, when using digital cameras. Uh, if you're using a monochrome, a monochrome camera, I would re I recommend a, a filter wheel, a motorized filter wheel. That will basically, uh, a motorized one is uh, better than a, mon a manual one because, it, you know, um, when, when you're imaging planets, you want to image fast, as fast as possible. Then the filters, the RGB filters, and some very important scientific filters like the infrared, UV, and the methane band. Of these, the methane band is uh, particularly important because a lot of uh, special features, especially on Jupiter, like high altitude clouds, or impact remnants are bright in methane band. Uh, this is a, I think uh, this is a more expensive filter than most filters, but uh, they give a lot of uh, scientific info on, on the planets that we, we, we capture. Uh, one thing about the methane band is it's a narrow band filter. So you'll probably need to uh, basically image like um, uh, the way you would image uh, deep sky. So you have to take dark frames. Anyway, we'll go over it tomorrow when we do the actual imaging. Another uh, important accessory I would recommend is a flip mirror. I know uh, it's difficult to find flip mirrors now, but when you're imaging at three or four in the morning and your brain isn't 100%, it can get frustrating getting that small planet into the field of view of the small chip of your uh, planetary camera. So um, it would be good to uh, use a flip mirror so things will be easier. It'll take you seconds to find the planet. And another important thing that you will need is a motorized filter wheel. Uh, now, th this motorized filter wheel, um, uh, basically, uh, especially, it, uh, no, no, motorized focuser. I'm sorry. The motorized focuser, I would recommend the Crayford focuser because if you're going to use the uh, um, uh, mirror focuser, uh, you're going to have image shift. And when you're ha having a basically the small, um, uh, image window of a planet, and uh, it's it's difficult to keep the planet uh, in the field of view when you're focusing using the mirror. So a Crayford focuser with a motor would really help, and uh, it's 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 very uh, important to achieve the fine focus. Uh, it's easier to do fine focus with a motorized focuser than doing things manually. And the last accessory I would recommend. I know it's uh, it might look. Uh, uh, minor, but actually for me, this was a very big help, is the vibration suppression pods. If you're imaging on concrete surfaces, uh, especially with surfaces with a lot of vibration, the VSP, uh, there's, uh, I think Celestron sells these. Uh, uh, other companies also sell these. 
uh, they are very important. In my case, um, they, uh, they, they basically convert high frequency vibration to low frequency vibration uh, on hard surfaces. In my case, I use image on a veranda, which has a lot of vibration. And I would say it basically helped maybe plus two on the seeing scale in uh, improving the image uh, using these uh, vibration suppression pods. Now, uh, the location for imaging, um, uh, here are some uh, things that you have to uh, bear in mind. Um, location is very important. Uh, of course, you know, what's the best place to, apply to image planets? It's to be on an island close to the equator, close to the sea, <laughs> and uh, with, with winds from the sea. But uh, there are other things that you have to also bear in mind, like stay away from heat sources. Uh, uh, right now, it's not a big problem uh, early in the, in, in the morning. But uh, when you're imaging in the evening, uh, hot roofs can basically degrade images. And uh, another thing is heat sources like air conditioning, heaters. Uh, these things uh, can degrade image. So if you can stay away, even your floor, uh, if you're uh, imaging on a concrete floor and it's hot, especially on early evenings, what I normally do is I basically spray it with water, basically hose it down the floor just to cool it about three hours before imaging. So uh, it's important to keep these little things uh, um, uh, perfect uh, because it's not always that we get bad images because of seeing. Next, uh, we need to cool the telescope. Uh, the C8 small telescopes, it's easy to cool. But if you have a bigger telescope like my C14, it takes about two to three hours to cool. So uh, I had to you know, spend time to cool the, the telescope. Then uh, of course, uh, collimation is very, very important especially for Schmidt-Cassie grains or Newtonians. Now, when you do, uh, especially when you're imaging with the Schmidt-Cassie grains, and uh, you have to collimate on camera because uh, there's a little flexure, there's a slight flexure when you're, uh, especially with your filter wheel, the, the, the bar low, plus you have the uh, flip mirror, there's a little slight flexure which can affect collimation. So you have to collimate in camera with with a uh, with a uh, with a uh, you know the object that are in my case I don't actually collimate with 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 the planets especially when they're low in the sky I would choose a star about 70 80 degrees above the horizon and hopefully when there's good seeing I actually collimate there uh, so far I've been lucky um, for the C14 that I have uh, I don't have problems with the uh, flexure uh, as it moves uh, around the sky, whether in the northern, north or south uh, uh, latitudes um, uh, uh, dec or declination, north or south declination. I, I don't have a problem um, with the uh, collimation. My telescope seem to keep collimation even as I move throughout the sky. So uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure with yours, but if your telescope does uh, have a flexure and changes its collimation, you may have to recollimate it to where your target object is. If you want to collimate on, uh, let's say Jupiter, I would recommend one of the moons like EO or uh, uh, Europa. This will be good targets for collimation. Uh, you, you, all you have to do is to basically put the, pla uh, the moon slightly out of focus and basically um, collimate from there. Uh, another thing is you have to plan your uh, imaging uh, session with Winjupos. Uh, we do post as a software, uh, it is a ephemerid where you can see the position of the moons, whether the great red spot can be seen. So, uh, you know, it, ha having preparation, you'll basically know what you're imaging. Now, for capturing, uh, there's a software called Fire Capture, which we use for capturing. Um, you know, uh, for now, this is for me the best software to use for capturing. Not only does it control your camera, it controls your filter wheel, even your telescope. It has an auto guide function that basically can keep your object by controlling your telescope, keep an object center in the center of your field of view. Uh, right now it can support uh, probably a few dozen cameras. Uh, it's, it's quite flexible. And one thing I like about this camera, it has a feature uh, which basically, uh, uh, what, what it does is uh, you can use your RAM as a buffer uh, for your camera. This is important when you're imaging the moon, when your hard drive cannot keep up. Oh, 
talk by the way talking about hardware something which i forgot to talk about is the hard drive uh which is very important part of your imaging computer uh right now uh you know there's hard drive and there's solid solid state drive for planets the hard drive can work uh without a problem but when, when you're imaging the sun or imaging the moon you will probably need a solid state drive to basically um be able to uh, get the data that the camera or for the camera to basically uh, for the computer to keep up with the data that the camera is sending it. So a solid state drive would be uh, an excellent choice. Um, the thing is, uh, uh, fire capture has a feature. Uh, I'll show it tomorrow uh, when we're doing live imaging. It's, it's a little complicated because uh, you have to basically include it in the startup of the program basically assign specific amount of RAM to your, from your memory as a buffer for fire capture. So uh, using this would really help a lot to basically uh, help you uh, basically have less drop frames compared to uh, if you don't use a RAM buffer. Uh, you actually have to, well, anyway, I'll just show it to you now. Uh, oh. Here, it's actually on the startup. So you go to the where you're gonna start and properties, and uh, there you have it. Uh, I wonder if you can zoom it. So basically, you have to add this. Uh, uh, where was that? Where was the notepad here? Or let's just use Word. So so you have to add these two. Now uh, the number nine is nine gig. So my 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 laptop has about sixteen gig of memory. So I basically assign uh, these two, uh, uh, actually, I think S is minimum, X is maximum. So you have to assign these two, how much RAM you want to de dedicate um, uh, for your imaging, uh, for, fire, for fire capture as RAM buffer. So just uh, add these two uh, commands uh, to the command line of uh, fire capture. Basically, you add it here in the property section here. So when, when, uh, when basically fire capture uh, launches, it will basically dedicate those RAM as buffer. So uh, yeah, here it is again. So just use this command uh, for, uh, for the buffer for fire capture. And uh, let's go back to the talk. And uh, lastly, about the fire capture, uh, it has a. It's uh, make sure the focuser, the the filter wheel, the mount is all ASCOM compatible, because uh, this this is very important. Uh, basic basically because um, uh, 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 fire capture runs on ASCOM. So make sure that the device that you have has an ASCOM driver. And uh, lastly, uh, one thing nice about uh, Fire Capture is it's free, so you can download it anytime. Now here are the controls, uh, basic controls of Fire Capture. It's basically uh, exposure and gain. These two uh, basically make the image brighter, but there are pros and cons. Uh, the exposure would control your frame rate. so. The, the faster your exposure, the more frames you will be able to capture. Basically, your frame rate will be one over your exposure time. So let's say you're doing one over 10 seconds exposure. So you'll, you'll probably get, you'll get a frame rate of approximately 10 frames per second. Uh, for Jupiter, I actually capture about one over 100 seconds. So basically, it's about more or less about 100 frames per second that I'm capturing. Now, the next is the gain. The problem with the gain is the higher the gain, the more noisier the image will be. So you probably have to play with exposure time and the gain. Um, uh, 
you know, uh, another thing that you have to use, uh, especially with the cameras these days, is the region of interest. Again, I will uh, basically demo this tomorrow uh, since we'll have more time and we'll, we're doing the live demo on how to do the ROI. ROI, basically region of interest, basically you're reducing the, the frame uh, of the, the camera because most planets are very small. Now, why, why is this important? Um, well, uh, three, three reasons. First of all, um, you get faster frame rates when you're using ROI because the, the camera is sending less data. Second, you have a smaller data set. So in case you wanna back up in the future, uh, your data is smaller. And uh, because your uh, file size are smaller, in, uh, you, you, uh, when you're processing it as, as uh, auto stacker, you know, processing would be a lot faster. So these things that you have to bear in mind, um, you know, when you're using ROI. Now, a lot of people are asking, should we use 16-bit or 8-bit? Uh, well, um, I've been using 8-bit for, for years. Uh, I know some imagers use 16-bit. Uh, uh, for me, um, I, I like to use 16-bit, 8-bit uh, because the file size are smaller. And uh, I don't see any image difference, the quality, quality-wise. When, especially when you're using very high gain, uh, I don't see a big difference between 16 and 8-bit. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, for me, in my opinion, 8-bit uh, would be more practical. Of course, 16-bit is better if you have more time for processing, but uh, practical-wise, um, you know, 8-bit is good enough. Now, an important step, uh, especially uh, since right now, when we're imaging planets, there's another extra step that we're doing. Uh, one problem with planetary imaging is that uh, there's a limited amount of time that we, we, we can uh, give to capture each frame. And this is the reason is because uh, the planet rotates. The rotation of the planet sets a limitation on how long you can capture. So, uh, but there is a way out of it. And uh, WinDuPost, uh, which is a software, uh, basically, uh, um, uh, uh, basically helps us overcome. So one thing you should uh, do is uh, there's this here with Jupos file naming convention. You have to press this and and basically activate this with Jupos naming convention. This will help you when you're doing uh, imaging, uh, when when you're doing processing with Win Jupos, which I will demonstrate this Sunday. And uh, what are the capture secrets? Uh, you know, a lot of people were asking me, uh, what's your, uh, uh, what exposure time are you using? What are your settings? Um, tomorrow you will see that it's not a simple answer because it's just like when you're asking, what gear should you use when you're driving? Uh, basically, my settings change every night depending on transparency and seeing and mostly because of transparency. Uh, but uh, basically, you have to find a sweet spot in your uh, setting. Uh, one thing I would always recommend, um, use the fastest frame, frame rate possible without going over uh, four, uh, 400 dB. Um, this is for the camera that I'm using, the 290 uh, uh, QHY290. Um, don't go over... Uh, uh, 400 dB, but in some cases like Saturn, I, I do sometimes go over 400 dB, but uh, using a, uh, it's, a, it's a good rule of thumb of you for using um, basically an exposure time where you don't go over 400 dB. Uh, again, in, in gain, uh, turn off gamma. And when you're uh, basically imaging, uh, spend time to focus. Uh, a lot of people are asking, what's the, uh, secret for focusing. Yeah, honestly, when, when seeing is good, it's easy to focus. But when seeing is not so good, uh, it, you know, focusing can be a challenge. Uh, what I do is a method called jogging. So basically what I do is basically go in and out of focus and basically try to find the midpoint. It's easier to do when you're uh, using a um, motorized fo focuser. So you'll know how many clicks you have to do when you go basically where you're in the center, you go out and when you go in, uh, in a sense that you can basically judge what the midpoint is by counting how many clicks that you need to go in and out of focus. 
So basically, that's how I do my focus. Uh, so far, it's been uh, uh, an effective method, but usually when the seeing is below five, uh, it's really, really tough to focus. Uh, Next, Chris, uh, real quick. So somebody's asking, why should you turn off the gamma? Uh, well, basically, you know, one thing about gamma, it's it, it doesn't really add anything to your image. And uh, what, what, one thing I realized that uh, basically the contrast is less when you turn on gamma than when you don't use gamma. Is that it? Yeah, that was it. Sorry. Okay, okay no problem. Uh, lastly, uh, one, one thing about uh, the final image quality depends on, you know, all the small details that you do from uh, basically the, the preparation that you have, the location, the, the cooling of your OTA, the collimation, uh, uh, the, the seeing. Of course, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's always easy to say that, you know, you get the best image when the seeing is good. But uh, we don't always get good seeing. So uh, we, we just try to live with what we have. So if you, if you get everything perfect, those little things perfect, it helps in getting a better image. Uh, you know, uh, no matter how, how, you know, how bad your image is, uh, it's, it's difficult to get data uh, or good quality image if your raw image is bad. Now for image processing, um, what I normally use, right? Uh, well, basically the, the standard software right now is AutoStacker. Uh, Emil has uh, created a very good software for stacking and uh, it has multi-point al alignment. Uh, I've used it for many years now and it's far superior than Registax that we were using before. Uh, uh, a lot of it, uh, one thing about uh, AutoStacker, it's very easy to use. Again, we'll demonstrate how to use it on Sunday. And uh, one thing, or Monday, I'm, uh, or yeah, Sunday your time, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused because we're right now one day ahead. Uh, we will talk more about it on Sunday uh, on how, how to use this auto stacker. Uh, one thing, uh, so I would recommend that if you have, uh, if you can just download this software ahead of time so we can demo it and you can also try it yourself while we're, we're doing the demo. Uh, one thing nice about AutoStacker, it can do uh, multiple, uh, 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 you can process uh, basically uh, multiple uh, files at the same time. So what I normally do in my schedule, in my workflow is after imaging, especially when it's still in the middle of the night, I basically copy my image to a removable hard drive or my data to a removable hard drive and uh, basically move it to my desktop and just have the desktop process it until you know it's done and when i wake up in the morning you know the data is ready for me to work on so uh one thing nice about the multi-point alignment is that uh, you can get uh, better quality data on each region especially when you're using very very high power uh you know seeing tends to be different on different areas of the the planet Anyway, um, we'll discuss more of this on Sunday. And uh, here, uh, Registax, you know, Registax uh, can never go away because of this feature called Wavelets. You know, Wavelets is really magic for me. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, you have to have the correct uh, or a, a, a sweet uh, settings on the Wavelets to get fantastic image. A lot of people I see, uh, you know, a lot of their images uh, look blurry because, you know, after stacking, the image does look blurry. You have to use Registax to basically draw out the image and uh, getting the right settings is very important. And again, we will be discussing this uh, more thoroughly on Sunday uh, on how to basically process this data. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good sharpening tool. Then uh, lastly, um, when you're doing monochrome, uh, you, uh, normally we do uh, red, green, and blue. Uh, we use uh, Photoshop to basically uh, uh, basically merge these images. Again, I will show this on Sunday uh, on how to do it step by step on uh, basically doing the the this uh, uh, 
uh, RGB merge in Registax. And uh, lastly, after processing everything, um, of course, there's also um, WinJupos. Um, I'll talk more about it on Sunday because it's easier to explain doing an, a live demo than uh, uh, basically talking about it. But one thing about uh, 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 when you're doing uh, WinJupos derotation, um, uh, bear in mind that when you capture, uh, you capture sets of data now, not just a single RGB. Uh, what, 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 what is uh, derotation? Derotation is basically stacking on steroids. It's basically stacking uh, with uh, well overcoming the rotation of the planets. So uh, what uh, we Jupos would basically do is basically convert uh, the planet uh, and basically align it on the central, uh, the, the basically the, the meridian. So uh, each meridian point will be merged by wind Jupos. So basically you overcome the rotation. And so, as I said, it's, it's basically stacking on steroids. It changes the way you capture because right now, instead of just doing RGB, then the rest of them, you would all actually capture a set of RGB. I will explain this tomorrow when we're doing the live imaging on, how, on, on, uh, on why we do it and uh, how many that we capture. We'll, we'll get more info on that tomorrow. Again, when we're doing final processing, it's actually a fight between sharpening and noise reduction. Uh, for sharpening, we have a, a Registack wavelets and there's a software called, it's, this is actually a, it used to be a free software. Uh, it, Google bought it a few years ago, then DxO bought it. Uh, it's now a DxO Nix. Uh, there is a free version of this software that you can download. The newer version is, paid version, uh, you might want to test it. This is a plugin for Photoshop that you can use uh, for uh, basically sharpening. We'll, we'll demo this on Sunday. I will, I will show you how to use this on Sunday. And uh, the, for noise reduction, there are two tools in uh, uh, Photoshop. This is the speckle and dust and scratches that are very useful in noise reduction. And uh, finally, um, uh, right now, uh, you know, when you're doing the final image, there's a lot of debate, you no know, north up, south up. But right now, because uh, we're doing a lot of uh, support for uh, NASA spacecraft, uh, we're doing everything north up right now. So uh, this is basically the convention for uh, which uh, NASA is asking. And uh, of course, you save everything. We use UT time. So uh, everything will be the same for, for all imagers, the universal time. Uh, it would also, it's also recommended if you're using, especially when you're um, using derotation to indicate the amount of time that you use to capture in derotation and uh, get, get the central uh, meridian information. This is helpful in knowing where in Jupiter that you're observing. Um, again, uh, for Jupiter and Saturn, you need the three. Uh, three central meridian info for Mars, there's only one. And uh, again, oh, um, you need uh, information for the name, uh, your, uh, you include your name and location information. And uh, basically I'll add a lot, a lot something because of th this was supposed to be a basic talk. Uh, I think you'll, you'll probably find this information important. Um, Wait a sec, sorry. Now, um, I think you might find this uh, information uh, important. Now, when you're capturing planets, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll more or less demo this tomorrow, uh, how, what, what's the most important thing that you determine your uh, exposure time or gain? This one, the histogram level. 
you know, you see, you see this uh, histogram here. Make sure it's close to uh, as close to 100% as possible. But the problem with CMOS cameras, the capture is a very, uh, you know, the the, you know, the the histogram would jump very fast. I would recommend as long as you keep it between 89 to 95 percent. As long as it doesn't get to 100, uh, the closest that you can get before 100, you keep the histogram level that uh, uh, at that level. Why do you need the histogram high? It's just like you know, when you're imaging. Each of those pixels is like a glass of water, you know, this glass of water. So uh, you want that water to be as full as possible. Uh, so that's why, uh, wh why when it's the, the, the fuller it gets, as long as it doesn't overflow, uh, the, be the better contrast you're going to have. So as much as possible, keep the histogram level very high. Um, there's also a problem when your histogram level is too low, you get that onion ring artifact uh, uh, when you're uh, after stacking and you do apply um, uh, uh, wavelets on the edges you get that onion ring effect so to overcome that keep the histogram level high be mindful of the integration time because uh, Jupiter rotates very fast in my case for the C14 I limit each frame to be 30 seconds for the C11 45 and one minute for the C8 so uh, for focusing, you know, one thing nice about Jupiter, it has these two moons that you can use for focusing. EO and Europa will be perfect target for focusing. By the way, here's a secret. Um, of course, I'll show it tomorrow. When you're focusing, focus on the green filter. If you're imaging in monochrome, focus on the green because, uh, uh, well, if you get a good green image, then basically you'll get good. Uh, do I change focus? Uh, there's a focus difference between the blue and the green. And uh, it's a problem unless you have a uh, basically a focuser that is controlled by uh, fire capture. I would not recommend that you change the focus on blue. Uh, I, I know it might be, it, it might sound heresy for some imagers, but uh, the blue data isn't really that important in the final scheme of things. As long as you get good red and green, then you, know, you get a good data. Next is uh, when you're imaging in methane band, uh, you know, as I said earlier, methane band is a narrow band filter. It's like doing deep sky imaging. Um, you need slower exposure times. In fact, you need binning to, to, to be able to capture good data in, in methane band. Uh, because of the smaller size of the image, because of binning, I actually capture methane band up to two minutes and uh, like, when you do, you do using uh, deep sky, uh, where you're, when you're imaging deep sky, you need to actually take dark frames. And it's not just one single dark frame. Uh, I mean, the minimum is five. Uh, probably the, the uh, th that would be a minimum five frames uh, video for the dark frames. And you basically have to stack it in Registax. I will uh, basically demo this on Sunday. Oh, for Saturn, you know, when you're imaging Saturn, uh, you know, the only way to get images like this is using WinJupo's derotation. Uh, you know, the image that you're looking at right now is a close to, I think, 50 minute to 50 to 55 minute capture. That's 50 to 55 minutes of data <laughs> sitting out there capturing just for one image. Uh, the problem with Saturn is Saturn has very low surface brightness, um, which, uh, means that uh, you need more time to capture, more data to capture, to, to, to give it a basically uh, a good quality. Uh, if you notice in this image, a lot of low contrast features can be seen. Here you can see some spots on Saturn, which you will never see if, if you're not using uh, derotation. Again, when you're imaging Saturn, use histogram from 80 to 90% histogram. And uh, use high grain, high, high frame rate. Now, earlier I said that you have to max out at 400. You know, when I'm imaging Saturn, my blue is almost 480 dB or 48 dB. Uh, it, no, uh, in, in, in QHY, um, the, the settings they have is uh, in dB. And uh, uh, one thing nice about the QHY camera, it has actually, 
unlike other cameras which basically limit to 480 dB, you can actually go beyond 480 dB, although I would not recommend it. But sometimes uh, you, you might use it, especially with faint uh, objects like Saturn or Uranus or Neptune, uh, which basically would uh, require faster grain. Uh, you know, one thing about exposure time, uh, especially when se your seeing is not very good, you may have to use fast exposure time. So uh, it's basically a play between, you know, exposure time and gain. And uh, to overcome the noise of the gain, is, well, the only way to overcome it is to capture more image. And uh, lastly, Mars, uh, you know, Mars would be great for the Northern Hemisphere this year. Uh, although two years ago we had a great Mars, uh, we had a uh, uh, respectable, a very nice Mars opposition. The problem with that opposition was that Mars was way south, even for me. Uh, during that time of opposition, Mars was only about, I think, 50 plus degrees above the horizon here in Cebu. Uh, this year it'll be much higher because it'll be in the northern hemisphere. Uh, which will be a great opportunity for you guys in, you know, in Europe, in North America, in, in Japan. This will be an excellent position. Mars will be an excellent position. And the size of Mars is quite respectable this year, probably around 22 big arc seconds, uh, which is basically just three arc seconds less from maximum. So this year would be best for Mars. Now, when you're imaging Mars, uh, here are some... Uh, uh, one thing you should bear in mind, uh, please check your RGB filters, especially the blue filter. Uh, when I started imaging, um, I was using filters uh, from Edmund Scientific. And uh, I had a problem with their blue filter because their blue filter had an IR leak. So uh, my Mars image were horrible during that time because of the blue, I couldn't get good blue. So when you're imaging at, with the blue filter on, on Mars, you should not be able to see or the, the details, the albedo features should be very faint. The only thing that you should be seeing on blue are clouds. So just keep that in mind. That's why when you're imaging with blue, you know, have the histogram only at 70%. Make sure that the surface is dark, but you know, all the, the bright spots are the clouds, the, the morning, the afternoon clouds, or the poles of Mars, the, the ice caps of Mars, or the polar hoods of Mars. These are the things that will be bright in blue. So these are the things that uh, you should see in, in, in your live capture. For the red and the green, again, uh, it's 80 to 90%, uh, not as high as Jupiter or Saturn. Um, one thing about Mars is that uh, it, it rotates slowly, slower than uh, Jupiter and Saturn. So you can actually have up to four minutes uh, capture time for Mars. And uh, make sure that, again, uh, that uh, you have an IR block on your filter. Okay, so uh, so far, uh, do you have any questions? Yes, there is quite a lot of questions for you. So let me okay. just change this so we can see every uh, both of us. Uh, where do I start? <laughs> so the first question here, uh, and this is actually an interesting question for Autostacker. Um, should you use fewer larger squares or should you use many smaller squares? Now, I have my own opinion on this, but I want to see what you say for this one. Um, well, it, it really depends on uh, the object, how, how big your object is. Uh, well, let's, let's just do a sample here. Uh, where's all the stacker? Okay. So this is last night's data. Um, you know, for, for this size, um, you don't have to do the smallest uh, size as possible. Um, in, in, in my case, uh, I use 104 and uh, I only use uh, place AP. I don't actually do this uh, manually. I, I do everything automatically. Um, uh, well, it depends. Uh, for, for, for this one, I would use uh, 104. Uh, when, when, I am using, uh, when I'm using the methane band, because you know, the methane band is smaller, and if you use this, you don't really gotta get a lot. I, I usually go down to 48. So it's 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 basically it depends on on, on how big uh, on how big the the uh, uh, your capture is. So usually when I do the sizes of the squares, uh, and I do a lot of solar imaging. 
Um, what the size of the squares actually can help determine here is the actual tessellation. So when you stack one image on top of the other, yeah. even though the actual circle of the whatever it is you're looking at, mm. the moon or the sun or whatever it is, mm. fits within the same field, different yeah. parts of it ripple at different mm. points. And yes. what I found here is, is on you know, things like the moon, if I have a smaller grid size, it'll actually watch what the tessellation does across the entire surface over mm. each image. And what happens yeah. here is, is the reference frame actually looks at all the other ones and then mm. says, right, that one needs to come this way, that one needs to go that way, that one needs to go that way. So what happens here is mm. if you don't actually have enough of these squares or they have a bad placement, you will actually notice when the stack comes out, you'll have this strange smearing in certain areas where it's like shifted and like weird things happening. Mm. So I, again, I, the principle I, still works within the planets, but you don't want to go nuts. That's the important thing. Yeah, I, I don't think get, getting you know as small as possible would be useful for the planets because uh, no, definitely not. No, no. Uh, it, it's basically you, you have to play on how big the the size of your your capture is. So. Uh, I would go, it's it's not really smallest or the biggest, but somewhere in between. So next question is uh, vibration suppression pads. Are those for reducing vibrations from the environment or from the equipment itself? No, that's for the ground. Okay, do you want to explain uh, why you would use a vibration suppression pad in general then? No, I, I, I live, especially when you're, uh, you're imaging in concrete, uh, concrete surfaces, uh, you know, my, my, my floor vibrates. So uh, what those uh, vibration suppression pod does is it, it converts the high frequency vibration to uh, basically low frequency, which the lucky imaging can basically overcome. So basically it, it reduces the amount of floor vibration. Okay, so next question mm -hmm. for RGB sets, what is the integration time window for planets like Jupiter? Um, I, I think I explained this earlier. Just in case they uh, missed it. Okay, uh, it's uh, 30 seconds when you're, well, it depends first of all on your focal length and the telescope size. So uh, there's, you know, if you're using a smaller telescope, you can get longer. For the C, as I said, uh, for the C14, I'm using um, 30 seconds. Uh, for the C11, 45 seconds. And the C8, one minute. So uh, basically, yeah, that's with a 2x Barlow. Okay, I'm just going to ask this one question in reverse because somebody else asked a different question that would benefit from the first question being asked, which is, what about using uh, 4K video capabilities of DSLR or mirrorless cameras? How do they compare to CCD CMOS? Uh, well, you know, one problem with the, uh, you know, um, uh, these big cameras, uh, I don't think you will benefit anything for uh, 4K. In fact, uh, uh, we're even using ROI. We're trying to reduce the the frame. Uh, first of all, you know, this, the planet you can act, there's a limited, you know, the size of the planet is very limited. We can't really get you know huge like size of the moon for the planets, basically because of uh, the atmosphere uh, seeing. So uh, one problem with when you're using DSLR and uh, uh, basically. I'm not saying that you cannot use it for imaging. You can use it for imaging. Uh, I know some people who are able to get good images for that. But the problem is that the files are big. Uh, you know, the planets when you're using the DSLR, you'll probably use two percent to three percent of the, the the chip. You're not going to use everything, uh, basically because the planet planets are very small. They're not huge, and uh, it's not about the pixel size. Uh, in fact, uh, the camera I'm using is. Uh, it's nine. It's basically. It's two point nine microns. Yeah, two point nine mic. Uh, it's two point nine microns, but uh, the thing is, uh, it has a nine, one nine eighty pixel by I think fourteen hundred or something. Mm -hmm. But I only use uh, I think uh, one uh, seven hundred by seven hundred pixels. ROI. So mm -hmm. that's the only useful space that I'm using. So uh, there's no, uh, you know, using a DSLR, having that big frame will not benefit you. And the problem is also the frame rate uh, because of the, the big size of the chip. 
and also the interface, whether you're going to burn it into your uh, SD card or remember uh, most DSLRs or mirrorless cameras, they only use USB 2. They don't, I don't think there's one that uses U, USB 3. So the, uh, the transfer the, that- The newer cameras will have started to use USB 3. Yeah, well, if they use USB 3, and let's say you're using 4K or even at full HD, you'll, you'll probably get as high as, uh, how much about, if, if it's uncompressed, probably about 30 frames per second. Mm -hmm. Because if you, you know, if you go to 60 frames per second, you have to compress those data. I don't think, uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, if, even with my camera, which is about two, two megapixels at full frame, my, my, uh, it can only do uh, probably about uh, 30, 40 frames per second without any compression. So uh, I don't think, uh, I'm not saying that uh, you cannot use a DSLR or mirrorless for planetary imaging, but it would not be ideal. Well, so some of the older Canon cameras uh, used to have a 640 by 480 crop mode. And in all honesty, the way I discovered uh, planetary imaging was by using a DSLR. This is before I even owned any of these cameras and I'd only just gotten into the, the, mm. um, the hobby. Mm. And what I discovered here is even with the 640 crop mode uh, at 60 frames per second, my biggest enemy was actually compression. And yes. the the compression that they're using on these Canon cameras are just so severe that I used to get too many artifacts and I'm forever trying to like process these artifacts out and it just never would work. So this brings me into the next question is, is there any advantage of using a still set even in raw versus doing video on a camera? Is it better to use uh, the camera as a video or is it better to do it in stills? You, well, it uh, well, you can actually use both. Uh, I know Anthony Wesley, I'm not sure if he's still doing it now. Before he used to do still. And uh, the, well, the, the only thing is, uh, you know, quality wise, image quality wise, there's no difference between using a still and a video because they're just, just, two, the same, just two different formats. But when you're processing, I think it's a bit messy when you're using still than, you know, when you're using video. So here's an interesting question. Um, and again, this is very subjective in so many ways. When you're imaging planets, and I guess when you're imaging anything in general, is it best to keep the gain down as low as possible? Or is there an advantage to having a higher gain? Well, um, as I said, uh, what we're trying to achieve is the histogram level. Uh, um, it's, it's a difficult question to ask. Of course, we would want to have as low gain as possible, but you know, uh, we get what nature gives us. <laughs> you know, it's not always that we get perfect conditions every day. So uh, we, we need to fight seeing, we need to overcome transparency. Uh, that's why we use high gain. But the thing is um, uh, before we, we had a problem with gain because uh, when you're using high gain, you, you have a terrible image. Uh, there's no way to help it. But with derotation, you know, it's, it changes the game. Example, um, the seeing is good, but you know, uh, there's clouds and the transparency, let's say is about 10%. So what I do is instead of capturing four, four images to get a good image normally on best seeing, I would capture 20. So uh, in a sense, in the end, I'm still able to get a good image even with poor transparency and you know, salvage the situation and using high gain. Um, one other question here, and it, it's in reference to filters. Uh, mm. I know this person mentions only just the one filter, but I would probably be better if we do it this way. Mm. So we're gonna start with this. Mars, would it actually benefit to use a IR filter or would it actually cause more of a problem? Uh, what do you mean IR? IR pass or IR block? Uh, well, uh, that's the thing that the person oh, hasn't okay. mentioned. So the idea would be here is, is which one would be better suited, IR pass or IR block? Uh, well, uh, first of all, if you're taking RGB, you, you, you know, the image has to be IR blocked because if not, you'll get 
um, uh, crazy problems. Uh, what you need is IR pass. For IR pass is uh, you you can get uh, some details, but one thing I noticed it's close to red. Uh, the the image is close to red. Sometimes when you're seeing is not good, instead of using red, you can actually use IR for your I R R G B, like I R G B instead of RGB, probably that's what he, he probably meant. But, you know, if you're taking uh, basically color image, you know, you want the IR blocked while the IR has to be passed. Now, you have to be very careful. Um, when you buy filters like UV, IR, um, this is one thing I discovered which really drove me crazy. And uh, the problem is I lost, you know, I lost a lot of money. One time I bought an IR filter and uh, I didn't know, uh, but after, you know, I tried to image an object and I, I was wondering what the heck is wrong? I was imaging Uranus with my IR filter. Why is it bright? Then I went back and checked the, the, the data for the filter. It had a UV pass. I mean, <laughs> I bought an IR filter with a UV pass so, or UV leak. And the other way around, I bought a UV filter which has an IR leak. So you have to be very careful when you buy an IR pass or UV pass filters. Make sure that it doesn't have a leak on the other end of the spectrum. So and, can you stack filters together then? Uh, you know, the problem is we have a filter wheel and I don't think it's that simple to stack on a filter wheel. Yeah, no, I've, I've had that pe uh, question asked before. I mean, oh, it is, oh. in some oh. ways you can do it. It depends on your camera setup and if you're using extension tubes and things like that. And there are opportunities to add filters within the path, but generally speaking, it's probably best not to use multiple filters of all different types then I'm assuming and, and trying to stack them on top of each other. Uh, it's difficult because first of all, when you, you, when you add these filters, you lose light. Uh, which means you can, you know, you 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 basically uh, have to use a slower, uh, more gain or exposure time. And the thing is, you know, most of the filter wheels right now are very thin filters, so there's no way to stack them. And the big problem is if you place it in front, we, we actually image UV and IR. So if you block these two, uh, you know, uh, what's the point? You have to remove it in between imaging. Uh, it, 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 it's a lot of complicated, it has a lot of more complication. And later on, you, uh, I will explain when we're doing processing why it's not good to touch your camera when you're imaging. Because Excellent. in derotation, in derotation you, you, want every, you want everything as is. Okay, so this is actually a good question here. Um, if all your SETs are the same focal ratio, obviously different sizes, and you're using a 2x Barlow, why is your integration times different? Well, uh, you know, uh, you know, the telescope we can control, but Mother Nature we can't. So uh, in the end, you know, if there's clouds or thin mist and the transparency is low, I get low. I should, you know, I, I have longer integration time. When the seeing is good, I get less integration time. If the seeing is bad, let's say the seeing is about five over ten. Instead of getting four, I get fifteen and stack less and uh, derotate everything. Ooh. Okay, so uh, for those no, no, of... I, 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 no, no that, that, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, but the, the integration time probably is, you know, different SETs, different folk have different focal lengths. I think uh, C8 is 2000, C11 mm -hmm. is 2800, and uh, C14 is, I think, 30. 38, 38 30, so, yeah, something like that. I think, but the yeah. F ratio is the same, like F9 across the board or something, or F10. Yeah, but you know the the, the integration time is not about uh, the F ratio, but how fast the planet rotates. Right. Okay, so obviously the higher the magnification in this particular case, or the longer the focal length, really, should I say, the yeah. more apparent the movement is going to be, hence why your integration time is shortened. So, for example, Jupiter rotates once on its axis, is what, Every 10 10 hours. Five, 5 hours, right, more which less. means that within a space of five and a bit hours, let's just say you could watch Jupiter from one side to the other, you can see it make one complete side from yeah. one end to the other, hence 
you can actually watch the red spot come all the way around and then end up on the other side, which is, is yes. quite amazing. And there's plenty of people that have imaged stuff like that. Yes. Um, so some of these other questions we're going to leave for tomorrow. And the reason why is they will get answered tomorrow. Um, so real quick, what is the camera and the filter wheel that you like to use? Right now I'm using the QHY 290 mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I'm using uh, Starlight Express uh, filter wheel. Um, I, I love this camera because uh, first of all, uh, oh, this is an interesting uh, thing. Um, a lot of people are asking me, um, I, I'm, I'm actually using the QHY 290M. This is a cool, technically a cooled camera, but I never use the cooler. So you can actually use the the, the small QHY3290 instead of the, um, the, 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 the 290 with cooler. Why don't I use the cooler? Because when I turn on the fan, the whole thing vibrates and uh, I get mush. So the, the oh, image quality is, is horrible thing. when you turn on. But why do I still use the cool camera? It's because of temperature. The cool camera has better, um, I think, uh, basically hardware that keeps the camera cool. So right. my camera, I, I live in the tropics, so it's pretty hot here. And with a cool camera, my camera's temperature is around 30 degrees centigrade. With a... Uh, the other camera with the, the uncooled camera, the, the temperature can go as high as about 50 to 60 degrees. So there's a 30 degree differential uh, for, for temperature wise, which is a lot for, for, for uh, CMOS and CCD cameras. So, so, for uh, those, for, so those of you out there, um, the hmm. 290 comes in two variants, which is the cooled and uncooled version. And as Chris was saying, he uses the cooled version, but without the cooling capabilities which effectively turns the camera into a passive cooling system because it actually has a heat sink built into the back of it. Yes. And then obviously there's, a fa there's an active cooling fan that actually takes the heat away from the heat sink. But there's quite a few different designs of these cameras that I've seen with these types of things, which is also why we've done a special. So if you guys are interested in, in picking up one of these cameras, I believe we are doing a 20% off the entire package when you buy both the camera and the QHY filter wheel. So that's the 290 cooled with the smaller filter wheel um, is 20% off right now, coupled with the 10% off uh, the chroma filters. So there is no reason and there's, you, you shouldn't even be waiting. Now yeah. is the time to actually get one of these cameras. Yeah. Any other QHY cameras that you recommend for doing um, imaging for planets and things like that? Right now I've only used the 290. Uh, I think for the color, if you want to go color, uh, probably the 244 might be a good choice. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of people have uh, had good images with that, with a 24, uh, 22, uh, is it 224, 224? Yeah, 224. 224, yeah. But in my case, my, my only experience is a 290. And uh, the reason why I use it is because it's a back illuminated camera. Um, it's, it's basically um, the most uh, sensitive right now available for planetary imaging. And uh, what I really look at is the methane band, uh, all close to the 900 nanometer, where it's very high in sensitivity, high in uh, QE at that point in uh, 900 nanometers. But uh, you know, for filters, uh, um, I've, I've been using Chroma for years, and uh, the reason is because uh, it has very high pass pass through bandwidth, close to 100 percent. So and they don't uh, have UV leaks in them. No, no, no UV leaks. Uh, you know, one thing, uh, you need everything optimized. You need as much light as possible. Uh, you know, some people say, uh, you know, uh, I live in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the seeing is not good. Uh, why should I use a C14? The reason is because you can actually stop down. Uh, instead of, let's say, using a 2X Barlow, you can use it without a Barlow. And with the amount of light that you're getting, it's basically about the light more than the magnification. Uh, you can get higher frame rate and uh, you know lower gain. Uh, it's all about uh, getting more data, quality data, more light, and to get the best image. Excellent. All right, so we look forward to the demonstration tomorrow. Um, 
we will give you guys a heads up if the weather is bad. So if the weather does turn bad or turn for the worse, we will basically do a different presentation. So we do have a backup for you guys just in case weather is not permitting. Uh, I don't know where everybody else is from here, but I can tell you now we've got a cold front coming in to California, or at least in Southern California, which means I was going to do something, but I'm not now because I don't want to be freezing cold out there looking at the backside of a cloud. So um, before we run away, this is your last chance to post any questions while, while we're still on. And like I said, we are going to be doing a giveaway. Um, right now, I have one $50 gift certificate available. And if you want to win that $50 gift certificate, you must subscribe to our YouTube channel and you must hop onto our Instagram account. All that information can be found on our website, telescopes.net. Just scroll to the very bottom and look for those icons. Um, you must be subscribed to both our YouTube and our Instagram account. And all you got to do is send a direct message to us saying, I want to be a part of all of this. And we are going to randomly pick somebody out and announce who that is tomorrow. You do not need to be present to win. We will get your contact information and you will get your $50 um, gift certificate. So if there's no other questions, we're going to try and wrap this up. It is almost six o'clock our time. So we got about eight more minutes left. Okay, hopefully we'll have a good weather here because uh, right now it's uh, totally overcast right now. Uh, I don't know why it, it's supposed to be summer here. It's supposed to be dry season, but the last two days have been cloudy. So, um, Well, it, oh. it's, it's because we want to do something. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Will solar imaging be discussed tomorrow? No, it will not. Um, mm -hmm. We don't actually have anything planned for solar um during these next three days but if you actually look at our previous postings i actually went live during the test just so you guys could make you know see what was going on while i was testing this entire system because this is very very new to us and i, I actually have a control center here and i've got like too many screens i've got the lights on me and i'm starting to sweat now because of the heat generating from all this stuff um but yeah, so check out some of our previous images, uh, videos, and it will show you uh, some of the solar stuff. And if you guys didn't know, there actually is an active region out there right now, 2759, so that's AR2759. Uh, there was actually a sunspot and there's a couple of prominences, so it's well worth looking at. And um, hopefully we will see you back here tomorrow. Don't forget to check out our website, telescopes.net. Uh, or you can call us toll free 888-427-8766. We will be open tomorrow to take your calls, even though the store itself is closed. The hours is uh, Pacific uh, time is going to be nine till four tomorrow, I believe. So if you want to buy something or you just want to talk to somebody because you're probably bored like the rest of us are being <laughs> stuck at home in this amazing coronavirus madness, uh, feel free to give us a shout. And we will see you tomorrow. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to Chris. See you guys. See you guys tomorrow. All right. We will see you tomorrow. <laughs>